Po prostu ja Dubowska się nazywam. Dzień dobry. Uh, um, I took the opportunity of delivering this speech in English, so that's what I'm gonna do. Um, and my slides are also like half Polish, half English, just to make everything easier for us. Um, so I wanted to talk about the uh, freedom of speech in the areas where uh, law and culture kind of intersect. And what uh, um, actually inspired me to do that is the legal case between a very famous Polish director, Mr. Andrzej Żuławski, and the Polish <coughs> actress, Ms. Veronika Rosati. Uh, I want to say that the uh, image was uh, chosen by my boyfriends. <laughs> That's in no way implying what I'm going to say. But the, um, the case considered the book written by uh, Mr. Żuławski. Uh, it was called Nocnik. In Polish, it's like the night version of the diary, but also means in Polish the chamber pot or else potty. So it also has some kind of negative implications. And uh, mm, the problem with the book was that uh, one of the characters uh, depicted in the book uh, was in, according to Ms. Rosati, was uh, very much uh, like her. But the problem was that um, it was written in a very offensive way. The character was, well, not something you could be proud of that you're actually aligned to this character. So uh, Ms. Rosati sued Mr. Żuławski. Uh, for uh, two hundred thousand zlotys, it's like fifty thousand euro, and also she wanted to uh, eliminate the parts of the book that contained the said character. Uh, also, the uh, the book for the um, time of the process it was uh, blocked. It was uh, it couldn't be sold in any bookstores. It was the case of the preventive censorship, uh, and the main claim of Mr. Rosati was that the book breached her dignity and her personal rights. Uh, so uh, what I want to talk about is the approach of both parties to the case. Uh, the lawyers of Ms. Rosati uh, claimed that the character described uh, in the book has many biographical facts which help the ident identification of uh, the actress, but also is depicted with numerous <coughs> false information and uh, hurtful notions. Um, and the lawyer said that it's in fact defamation through literature. But the uh, lawyers, uh, the defending lawyers, claimed that uh, Mr. Rosati is not the character in the book, so she has no right to sue Mr. Żuławski, and also uh, that uh, her personal rights have not been breached, as she is not the character in the book, and also that the, uh, according to the theory of literature, uh, a novel cannot be a subject of investigation in categories of true-false regarding its content. But what's mostly interesting about this case is how the court approached it. They have uh, called numerous uh, expert witnesses from the uh, knowledge of literature, and uh, they were uh, deemed to decide uh, about the fact if the book can be actually regarded true or false. And the uh, main expert witness, uh, Professor Borkowska, she uh, said that the book uh, imitates a diary. And it, it's not a diary that imitates a novel, but it's a novel that imitates a diary. So we cannot in any way uh, suspect that the characters are, are actually true. Uh, but <laughs> even though that's what all the expert witnesses said. The court uh, sided with Ms. Rosati. And the, um, the sentence was that uh, Mr. Żuławski, along with the, uh, the editor, they have to pay not 200,000 zlotys, but actually 100,000. And that uh, they owe her an apology. But both sides uh, actually said that they uh, want to appeal because Ms. Rosati wants the book to be gone. And Mr. Żuławski said that he does not have that money. So um, the reasoning, unfortunately, of the case is, uh, is not public. So I can only have my uh, own uh, personal uh, suspicions about why, uh, why this uh, sentence was actually made. But um, what I think is that actually a lot of social aspects had to do with the case because throughout the whole uh, whole case, which was actually four years, 
uh, Miss Rossati was completely silent to the public media. She did not talk about the case. She did not approach any journalists. Whereas Mr. Żuławski was more than happy to give a lot of interviews. He talked about Ms. Rossetti in all those interviews, all the while saying that the book is pure literary fiction. But then again, he was saying that all the words are, not one word is false in the entire book. So he was kind of making a lot of not joint statements. And then again, in the book, there, there's this, um, the note that is in almost every book and movie that all resemblance to real characters blah 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 so like everybody was kind of uh, shocked that nobody knew actually what's happening but also i think that uh, a lot of um a lot of influence on the uh, sentence was al also that it was kind of a precedence for mr Zhuevsky because he actually did a very similar thing years ago when he divorced his uh, wife, Sophie Marceau. He wanted to publish a book about her, but actually Miss Marceau's lawyers were, were much more cunning and they blocked the book even before it went to print. So that's, that's a kind of a common case for, for Mr. Zhuevsky. Uh, so that case made me wonder because of the like high level gossipness of the whole matter, it made me wonder about blind gossips. Blind gossips uh, are the kind of gossips where um, there are no actual names used. There are, no, um, there are no biographical facts that you can identify a person with, like in the case of the book. And it's called the nuggets of gossip gold because it has become like a sport for all the gossip finders uh, that if you can actually um, you can actually identify the person hidden in the blind gossip that's kind of like a success so um, that kind of reminded me of the whole uh, case because that's actually the um, a way of the gossipers to avoid the law responsibility they actually make something like a fiction to to say that well it's not any bad news about the actor it's not any bad news about the director because it's all fiction it's not in any way identifiable so um also the credibility is a very important fact in the blind gossip so um it's not the case that you can just write something blasphemous about somebody and then just leave it there because if so you're not getting famous on the blind gossip arena because people say well they he just made it up to get famous for five minutes and it's not actually true so credibility is a very important thing here and actually blind gossips are not a um, not a new thing because it the history goes back to 1899 a colonel may, uh, named uh, William Mann, he um, published a book called Town Topics and he developed a column with blind gossips and he actually used the blind gossip column to, uh, to blackmail a lot of people, influential people, because he was saying that like, if you don't uh, help me fund like my new home, I'm gonna write something very bad in the blind gossip column, and even though it's appeared to be fiction, I'm gonna write something else on another page with the exact words used again, so that people can identify you as such person. So, um, what I'm wondering is, um, should blind gossipers get scared? Because if law is going into literature and law is kind of um, taking back fiction and making it true or false, then they can do the same thing with gossips and then the whole concept of blind gossips and, uh, and not having the law responsibility will be simply over. Thank you.